Ah. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. Wait, it's our pleasure to have with us uh, Beatrice so Seoane. We sat, uh, she's at the University of Complutense in Madrid. So a short video of her. So she, she did her PhD at the University of Complutense in Madrid. Actually, at the same time as me, we considered it there like for a couple of years. Then she moved to, to Rome, to La Sapienza, to for a postdoc, where she was collaborating with uh, Giorgio Parisi. Um, and then she went to Paris. And there she was, among other, in uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, Paris Saclay, and also Sorbonne University. And now she's back to Madrid with this uh, special fellowships that are this uh, uh, program of uh, attraction de talento a Comunidad de Madrid. And so she's working on statistical physics in Monte Carlo. And more recently, she's also combining this statistical approach to machine learning, which is also the, the topic of the talk of today. So the floor is yours now. <laughs> okay, I can start. Thank you, Alex, for the for the introduction. And uh, yes, as as Alex was uh, um, telling us before, I've done uh, most of me in my career in disorder systems, in particular in statistical physics of disorder systems and. I don't know, spin glasses, mostly spins, but not only, I have done quite a lot of work on glasses of the lattice uh, as well. And uh, well, in the last years, we have, been we have been trying to combine the tools we use it for disorder magnetic systems to, to apply for the samplings of energy-based models in, in machine learning. So I will be speaking a bit about, I mean, we have been revisiting the way that uh, restricted Goldman machines are trained. What I'm going to discuss, in principle, it applies also to other kind of energy-based models, so it seems to be quite uh, general and we think quite, quite useful, so I hope you, you like it. And, uh, okay, the work, uh, okay, you, I suppose, uh, you see myself, no? So, you see this thing here? I should remove No, no, it. no, we don't see it, no. Ah, okay, no, because since I had the screen, I didn't know. Okay, so this work I'm presenting, it was done in collaboration with Valerian Desel, who is also in the Talentos uh, program in the Complutense with me, and Cyril uh, Futletter, who is in, uh, in, in Paris. And the last part of the talk that I will discuss, in which is uh, work that we are writing uh, right now, it was done in collaboration with a student that was doing the master thesis last uh, year in, in Madrid in the Complutense with us. I don't know if I will have time to speak a lot about this, but I will introduce it a bit. Okay, so restricted Bolman machines belong to the family of uh, unsupervised models that try to be generative. This means that the goal is we're going to feed data to a machine. We want to feed the model. And once the training has finished, we would like to use the machine to generate new data that looks very much like the original data, but it's completely new. It's not one of the samples that we have before. Okay, in the literature, there are many possible uh, ways of doing this. One of them is these energy-based models to which uh, Airbnb uh, belong, but there are also many other possibilities. And in the last year, it has been, uh, it's becoming quite a, a popular other kind of methods that are, for instance, the generative adversarial networks, the, the GANs or the variational autoencoders. In this work, I'm only going to speak about the training of energy-based models, focusing on restricted Bolman machines, but as I said, it should be, but we know that it applies also to other kind of models. Okay, so we want to learn different kind of data. For us in principle, it could be any kind of, of data. Here in this presentation, I will show some results obtained for different data sets. For instance, the MNIST, that it's this digits, uh, hand digits database or Celeva, which is a data set of uh, pictures of uh, popular people. And also we have been, for the reasons, quite interested in studying sequence data. It can be DNA, 
So we can have different nucleic acids in its position of the sequence, or it could be proteins in which we normally speak of families of proteins in which we take different proteins that are that serve common ancestors. That would be, for instance, a particular protein that you can find in different organisms. You can compare the, the sequences and trying to do a statistics with this. Okay, so the, the idea of MSG-based models, and that's what the, the name is originated, is to the idea of, okay, for each configuration, we want to assign a particular energy function that could be, in principle, whatever, in which this energy function should depend on the variables that it will be, okay, we have images, it will be our, our pixels. Other variables that are Latin variables or hidden variables that we don't see that they are introduced in the model, but uh, they are not observed in the, in, the, in the configurations and certain model parameters. Okay, the idea of this energy function is that if we have an energy function, we can assign a probability to its configuration just using a, a, G, a Gibbs or a Boltzmann distribution. Of course, we don't know the normalization, but we know that at least the relative probability of, of its configuration. Okay, so the learning is precisely trying to find the parameters that makes uh, the data set a good configuration, um, the data set good equilibrium configurations of typical configurations of our model. Okay, these uh, models are normally trained uh, by log likelihood uh, maximization. And the idea is, okay, what we want to say, what we want to find, it's the parameters, this, uh, this delta, that makes the probability of observing a given set of, uh, of samples, the ones we had in the data set, maximal. So in this case, we are uh, summing up all the Latin variables. So we want to maximize the restricted probability of observing certain configurations. Okay, so this is normally trained uh, via gradient uh, descent, so normally a stochastic gradient descent. And we can see, I mean, from physics, because it's the same problem that we, we get normally, we cannot compute this, this log likelihood uh, function because we don't know the partition function. So we cannot, at least, unless the data set is extremely simple, uh, we need to estimate uh, the estimate these probabilities with using, for instance, Monte Carlo sampling or our uh, sampling, uh, favorite sampling uh, procedure. Okay, the energy function of these models can be essentially whatever. It can be a restricted Boltzmann machine that I will explain the, the architecture later. It can be deep Boltzmann machine, so we have several layers. I mean, the restricted Boltzmann machines, we just have two layers, or we can have as complex as we want uh, a network <coughs> with many different layers, with a lot of convolutional uh, layers, or whatever we want. I mean, the energy function in principle, it can be as complex as we want, if we manage to train it. Why do I want to focus on, on restricted Boltzmann machines and why we do we study this instead of considering more deep and fancy architectures. Okay, the first thing is that, okay, we are a statistical physicist and we like <laughs> the easy model. And also since with the, with the restricted Boltzmann machine, we can obtain a probability distribution, we can use more or less the same tools that we use in physics to study phase transitions, for instance, to apply for the training of the machine. So we can try to understand what the machine is learning. And another, uh, point that at least is what makes me uh, more interested on this, is that restricted machine, uh, restricted on my machine are particularly well suited for interpretability in the sense that once we have a machine that does what we were asking her to do, I mean, generate data properly, we also get a model that we can that we can analyze. And since the architecture of the restricted on my machine is quite uh, simple, we can extract, for instance, I will discuss it later, directions important for the data, or we can try to get knowledge of the, of the data set after training the machine. And it's important to notice that even if these machines are quite uh, simple, we just have 
I mean, in the simple uh, architecture, we just have binary variables. It has been shown, I mean, it's a theorem that we can fit whatever uh, complex uh, probability distribution of the data within this model. Yet, even if it's simple, there are a lot of reasons, not only because it's not efficient enough, there are a lot of reasons for not uh, using it. I mean, anyone that has tried to, to train restricted Goldman machine know that it's uh, quite uh, tricky. I mean, in principle, it seems very easy to train them, but later when you start to analyze what you get, you start to get often uh, weird results that I think we can explain at least why you get it in the results I will present uh, later. And also, even if you manage to train the machine well, it's quite unsatisfying that when you want to generate new samples, it can be that the generating phase it takes so long, so long that you don't know when you get the good samples or if you cannot even do it in, in time. And also one of the important drawbacks of uh, RBMs is that the, at least for now, there is no implementation with convolutional layers. So at least for image uh, data set, this is, a, this is a handicap. We cannot uh, deal with the translational symmetry. Okay, so for those that uh, don't know, restricted Volma machine was introduced quite a long time ago when Smolinski and especially popularized by, popularized by, by Hinton when he introduced the contrasted divergence uh, approach. And um, they have been for so long uh, used as pre-training small uh, networks for larger deep networks, not anymore. And especially in the last uh, 10 years, they are getting a bit in the shoes and other kind of generative methods like GAN or variational decoder are getting a lot, of, uh, a lot more popular. I mean, in parallel of this uh, lack of I mean, this decreasing in the interest of restricted Goldman machines in the, in the computer science world. In physics, they have been, there have been quite a lot of progresses in the last years, especially in the last 10 years. Right now we have a lot of, uh, quite a lot of uh, theoretical results about the phase diagram of the RBMs. We know also quite a lot about how the learning proceeds. And we even have algorithms uh, based on the physics uh, knowledge, for instance, using the TAP equations and using mean field equations to try to, to accelerate the, the learning. Okay. So coming directly for the restricted Bolman machines, the restricted Bolman machines are essentially easy models in the sense that we will have spins up and, and down. We are normally working with just zero and, and one, but what can be? map to the other one, in which we have a lattice which is bipartite, in the sense that we are going to have some few variables that we call the visible variables that interact only with the spins that are in the other layer, the hidden layer, which has the Latin variables. So there is no interaction in between the visible and there is no interaction in between the hidden. We can also make this model a little bit more general and include bias that will be just fields attached to each of the, of the speeds. Okay, in this model, the visible variables are going to be the data. So it will be, for instance, the pixels, if I get this, this image, and the hidden variables, those are going to be the neurons. And it's essentially what it's giving us the features that we want to start. So if we want to analyze for interpretability, we're gonna focus on this on this Latin uh, world and also on the, on the model. Because of these uh, possibilities uh, of interpretability of this kind of models, I, I have to say that the RBMs are getting quite uh, important in, for instance, in the, in the bioinformatics world concerning uh, sequence data, as I was saying before, as an universal tool to extract information from sequences that you don't know in an unsupervised, uh, in an unsupervised work. I mean, there has been quite a lot of work done recently on this. Okay, so just coming back to this idea, the for the rest, for the energy-based models, we have two different phases. We have the first one during the learning, we just feed the machine with with data, and we try to fit the parameters of the model, and later 
once we have a machine that it's uh, well trained, we to have the generating the generating uh, part in which we take the model and we want to generate new data. So now we have all the parameters of the model fixed and what it will change will be the, the dynamic variables. And once we explore the, the visible ones are the ones that are the new data, uh, the new data construct. So if we have a model that is good, we would like that if we take a random configuration and we start to sample the model in the same way that we would do with the easy model, we get the, the easy model and we start to, to do metropolis or hit bad. So we split the, we uh, reverse the, the spins and we want to go through the dynamical path towards equilibrium. We would like that if we do the same thing with the machines, uh, we get configurations. And here I showed you exactly this doing with uh, NIST and with uh, these phases with Eleva data set. So if we start from random, we want to, I mean, if the model really learned a good representation on the data, after a lot of time, we should be able to, to create good, uh, good new data. Okay, so, the learning, as I said, uh, passed by learning these uh, parameters of the model, which would be this uh, decoupling matrix uh, omega or this uh, bias for the visible or for the, here I left the, or the, for the visible or for the, for the hidden. And the idea is this. So for each configuration that we have at any stage of the learning, we, uh, we assign a probability that will be given by the, the energy that we assigned before with a partition function that we don't know how to, to compute, as I said before. So we are going to maximize the, the log likelihood. And for this, we need to compute the, the, gradient, uh, the gradient of the log likelihood to go, to go up. It can be seen uh, quite easily that in the restricted Bowman machine, the gradient has a very simple structure. It, it is composed by two parts. One in which, for instance, if we do the gradient over the, the coupling matrix, we're going to get the correlation between the visible and the hidden variables, but computed either using the data set, that is, we compute this magnitude using all the configurations that we had in the data set. This is easy. I mean, we have to integrate out the, the hidden variables, but this we can do it quite easily. And we have to subtract later the mean value in the model, which is the hard part, because as I said, we don't know the partition function. So with this, we cannot compute it exactly. We need to estimate it, for instance, with, with Monte Carlo. Okay, we'll pass later to how we do this, but just to come back to the interpretability, I want to uh, give some um, ideas why we think these uh, LVMs are quite useful for this. For instance, if we take this energy function and we sum up the, the hidden variables, so we get an energy. Once we have trained the model, we have an energy function for our model. We can, for instance, we can see that if we develop this expression in, in powers of, of the visible variables, we can see that we are getting effective models for for our data that contain correlations up to any possible degree, which is quite an advance, especially for instance, if we, if you compare it with the Boltzmann machine that has been, for instance, used quite a lot in, in the sequence uh, data world in which you could only stop in the two point correlations. So the models that we fit can fit in principle all possible co complex correlation in the, in the data. Also, uh, as I said, uh, there are quite a lot of results, uh, theoretical results uh, from statistical physics that tell us how is how does the the learning proceed once we get we get the real data. And it has been shown that at least at the beginning of the learning, you start with uh, you are in a phase when the when the couplings are small and, and random, we start in a paramagnetic phase. And once we start to learn some features, uh, the system suffers a, suffers a 
phase transition that it can be second order of first order. This is I will discuss a little bit. We are studying this a lot. I mean, in, in mean field, it's a, it's a critical a critical line towards a, a ferromagnetic um, a ferromagnetic phase. And how it does proceed? Okay, the, it can be it can be shown that the machine, the, the weight uh, matrix, start to learn the principal directions of the data set. So it will start learning the first uh, principal direction of the data set, and the second, the third, up to a certain moment, and later the, the learning crosses in other ways that we don't, we don't know. But I, we know that at the beginning, it starts exactly learning the, the principal directions of the data set. So we start, we know how these features emerge and we can hope that, okay, we know it, it's been, it's quite, um, uh, it's well known in, in data science that you can use this uh, principal value decomposition to, for instance, splitting, if uh, making emerge uh, some features in the data. So we can hope that the restricted Bowman machine give us a more, a, find uh, selections of the directions of your data. And here I showed you some results that we had from for our project in collaboration with Alessandra Carbone and Rebine van der Gen, in which we were using the restricted Bolma machine to extract directions in the, in the proteins during the training. And here I showed you the, if we take the, our family of proteins, we project it in the principal, directions of our weight matrix. I mean, we just do the, the SVD decomposition. If we project it in the first and in the second and the third and, and the fourth and so on, okay, we get several clusters, the data clusterized in different regions. And for instance, if we take uh, here, I color the different proteins in which we know whose function is by different color, we can see that without any prior uh, knowledge, only with the directions let's but the le uh, learn by the restricted Bolman machine, we can actually split the functions by, the, the proteins by function without a prior knowledge, which is quite nice. So the directions that the machine is, uh, is learning are actually physical and it can be interpreted in a biological, in a biological way. Okay, so coming back to the computation of the gradient, that is the main problem of the restricted Boltzmann machines. As I said, we have two parts, the one computed with the data and the one computed in the, in the model, where the second part, it has to be computed with Monte Carlo or Langevin Dynamics or your favorite uh, algorithm. So the normal, the standard procedure is that, okay, we can take, we take uh, several parallel uh, chains, Markov, chain Monte Carlo chain, we do a fixed number of steps, let's say K, in this case, it will be 50. And after this time, we take all the parallel chains and we compute this, uh, we estimate these uh, this mean values using the, the different chain. Okay, this makes sense. I mean, this will be an equilibrium, an equilibrium expected value. This will make sense if we, uh, make enough steps so that we reach equilibrium. We are starting to sample equilibrium. Otherwise, we will be okay. Uh, we will be approximating this this uh, this uh, mean value by a non-equilibrium expected value. Okay. So if we want to thermalize, we should do a number of steps that it's several times the the mixing time. I mean, if we want to be sure, it should be around twenty. I mean, we can be not that, not that restricted, but in any case, the problem is that in principle, we, I mean, this mixing time could be extremely long. We don't know, the model is going to change along the, the learning. So in general, in the literature, uh, another approach it has been uh, taken and it's saying, okay, we cannot do too many steps because just to, to remember what we are doing is, okay, we every time that we want to update the parameters, we have to compute this. So, and we have update the parameters really, really a lot of times. So we're doing in this, in this world like 
uh, 100,000 times. So each time you have to compute this. If we do, do a lot of Monte Carlo steps, this is going to get really, really accurate. So the standard reserves are just performing some few steps, typically of the order of 10. At the beginning, it was of the order of one, but okay, there is uh, no enough. Uh, computing and power for that moment, especially when the contrastive divergence algorithm was proposed by Hinton. And the idea is, okay, if we know, if we train properly a, a machine, uh, the equilibrium configuration should be essentially very similar to those of the data sets. So we can say, okay, if we assume that the equilibrium configurations of the model are similar to those of the data set, we, we could say, okay, we can initialize the chains always on the data set, for instance, the, the digits that we were considering before, just do some few steps and our estimation of the, of the model uh, mean value, I mean, the canonical mean value should be more or less uh, correct. Okay, it's a bit more uh, complex than this because normally this is done within the minibats, but the idea is, is this. Okay, this model was proposed in 2002 and it later was improved with a quite a clever idea is, okay, we continue doing just some few steps, but since we are updating the machine step by step, the parameters, the configuration that we had, I mean, if we, since we are changing the parameters really, really slowly, like if it were, we were doing an annealing in the, in the parameters, we can produce as uh, initial, initial configurations of these Marco chains, the ones we got from the previous training step and just do some few steps. And if we were in equilibrium, we will be mostly in equilibrium all the time, which is known as persistent contrast deep divergence. Or we can do, uh, as I said, we can try to do more clever updates like using the tap equations to improve the, the, the sampling, but this is, an approximation or there have been uh, several approaches to try to use parallel tempering algorithms or simulated annealing to try to get better equilibrium estimations. Okay, in the work that I was, uh, what that I'm presenting today, that was, uh, it was accepted for the audits uh, last year. We saw that actually the machine uh, performs in two different regimes depending on how you compute the gradient. Okay, if you use non-equilibrium configurations to estimate the gradient, we'd say that it's, it works in a non-equilibrium regime. And actually what you fit in the parameters is not the equilibrium model, but you encode the dynamics, use it to, to train it. I will explain later what I mean by this. If you use a number of Monte Carlo steps that it's enough, to reach equilibrium and to get a proper estimation of the gradient, then you end up with, um, with a model that, I mean, once we study the, the typical configurations in the model, they will match quite well the, the data set. So we can use it to extract the probability density of the, of the data set. What do I mean with this non-equilibrium regime? For instance, imagine we train the machine, but instead of, using the results that I was saying before, we just initialize uh, all the Marco chains at random. So it has no memory on the previous configuration. We do 10 steps and we update the parameters many times. What we see is that if later we repeat the same procedure for the sampling, which is the normal procedure for the sampling in which you want to starting from random obtain independent uh, configuration, we see that after 10 steps, we start to get numbers that I mean, we can get all the 10 numbers in, in good proportions. But if we continue later doing much longer samplings, I mean, we are exploring the, the configuration space of the model. Once we do samples long and long, we start to get very biased representations of this data. Clearly we get numbers, but as you see, most of them are a one with exactly the same structure. So the equilibrium configurations of this model clearly are not good configurations for, are, are clearly not good representation of the data set, but we get 
fairly better when we do just few steps. Okay, we could do the same trick, but in this case, we use a machine, um, a restricted Bellman machine train started from random by doing 100 steps. And once we do, okay, this was during the training, but now if we do the sample, what we see is that it will take us quite a lot more steps to start to get proper numbers. Okay, in this case, around 118 before we have 10. But again, if we do much longer samplings, we start to get exactly the same effect. I mean, we start to get all ones or this was with random, doing the random, if you, with all the receipts, you can get, for instance, all zeros. But the point is that we get very biased configurations that are clearly not very similar to the data set. Okay, our point is that you're learning actually the, the dynamics you use for the training. And for instance, you can see one of the bad consequences of this is that if you train the, the machine uses the contrastic uh, divergence uh, recipe, that if I recall you, it was starting always from the data set, you do some few steps, starting from numbers, for instance, in MNIST, you do some step of sampling and compute the gradient. And now, once you have this machine trained, which has quite a nice uh, log likelihood values, for instance, so it seems a good machine, you starting from random configuration, you start to do sampling of this machine. As, as you can see, we basically get nothing. I mean, we have changed just the initial conditions and you get no number, even if you go to very long sampling times. In fact, at the moment, we don't even get uh, images. It gets almost everything uh, black. On the other way around, we could say, okay, we can start initialize our Markov chain, our Markov chains from the data set and do steps because this would match exactly the, the training and dynamics. And okay, we can do this, we get numbers, but as you can see, we get exactly the same numbers that we gave uh, as initial configuration. So we are not generating configurations. We are essentially just repeating the same one. We get frozen there and if we go longer, I mean, trying to equilibrate, we get this all black. So at least from this talk, the message is don't use contrasted divergence because it's useless. If you cannot use it for generation and you cannot use it to, to study the, the model you get. Okay, this I was just speaking, okay, saying if we match the same, the same initial configuration, the same initialization of the Markov chains that we use during the, during the learning, we get quite good configurations, but we could not only change the initial configuration, but we can also change the dynamics. All the results that I was uh, showing before, they will, I mean, the sampling was done using heat bad updates, but we could, for instance, train a machine using mean field uh, steps, as, as I said before, with the tab equations. And if we get this machine well trained, Later, we can, okay, start again from, from random. Okay, it was done with mean field, but starting from random, the training. So now we do the sampling. You start from random. We do some steps, but we sample the, the machine using a standard hit well, bad dynamics. And we can see is that, again, we don't generate any kind of number. Here we, we get until 10,000 Monte Carlo steps. What happens if now during the sampling, we repeat the same kind of dynamics? I mean, we do tap uh, updates. Then in this case, this machine, it was, uh, it was um, trained using 100 steps and we can see, okay, it take me some time to reproduce numbers around the same time used for the training, but later we just get frozen there. It doesn't evolve anymore. In fact, we could study this in a, in a systematic way, we can consider a restricted Bondman machine trained with a recipe. In this case, starting from random, we do 10 steps and we do many parameter updates. Here I saw different numbers of the parameter updates uh, in different colors. These are in log scale, so this is much, much longer than, than the first one. And here I saw you, uh, we, we were trying to estimate how good the samples were 
as function of the, the number of sampling stems and the number of parameter updates. And here we can see, okay, this, uh, this error, it was the error in the, in the <clears throat> second, um, in the second, uh, in the two point correlations, or we can do the error in the, when we compare within the data set and the generated data, the, the power, the Fourier power spectrum. We did it with many possible observables, but uh, we always get the same results. So I don't saw it here. What we say, what we see is that, okay, we focus in the deeply trained uh, machines is that, okay, we start to sample and the quality of the data that we generate, it gets better and better and better. Okay, the error zero would be perfect data. We get the best data in this case in after 10 Monte Carlo steps. And if we continue doing the sampling later on, we start to get the configurations that are clearly worse. I mean, if we can compute the entropy and for instance, we can, we can see that we get configurations that has much less much less entropy, much less uh, variability. Okay, this I said it using machines that were uh, used, uh, were trained using random and 10 steps, but we can train machines using random and 100 steps up to random and 10,000 steps. And we get exactly the same, the same behavior. But the point is that the best quality point, it appears always at the same number of steps used to train the machine. So the machine has memory of how it was trained, which is clearly a, a non-equilibrium non effect. One of the nice things is that we can see that the quality, at least concerning these, uh, these operators, it's quite similar. I mean, the, the quality of the sample generated with this out of equilibrium scheme, it's quite similar, even if we do some few steps or we, we do many steps. The only problem is that in the case the machine was trained with a lot of steps, you will need as many steps to get good samples. What happens? Okay, this is a memory effect. Of course, uh, if we do simulations, we estimate the gradient with simulations that are long enough to equilibrate, it is not possible that, that we observe this. And in fact, if we get the, this machine and train with 10 uh, up to four, 10,000 steps, we can see that up to certain number of, of uh, parameter updates, okay, this will be so few and we go down in the number of parameters update, we see that the machine behaves in the way that one would expect. We start to sample it. At the beginning, we get not, well, we don't get numbers, but at a certain moment you get something that is good. And if you continue sampling, you get something that has more or less the same quality. Here I saw the same, um, the same kind of data, dynamical data during the sampling, and we can say, okay, in one, in this case, uh, okay, in ten thousand steps, which is the, the the number of tens we use for the machine, we get numbers. But the nice thing is that if we continue doing sampling, just do the same number of steps, we start to get other samples, and other samples which are the correlated with the previous one. Before, just to remember, we were getting always. Uh, configurations that, I mean, once we nucleate the numbers, we stay with the same numbers essentially forever. So once, if you have trained the machine in equilibrium, you get machines which are, you get models that are dynamically quite different. They are well behaved, they reach equilibrium, and they don't seem uh, frozen or, or glassy. So we have these two equilibrium, you got these two regimes. Okay, so as I said, if you compute the gradient in out of equilibrium, you learn the dynamics only. This, uh, okay, this I didn't show a lot of data here, but this can be actually profited to get uh, very high quality data because we observe that when you do the out of equilibrium, you, well, I mean, you start to exploit the out of equilibrium uh, phenomena, you get better data than when you do equilibrium, unless you do uh, something really, really long. And in fact, this kind of, um, of uh, recipe, it was proposed uh, a couple of years ago in the context of, uh, of a convolutional uh, a generated, uh, generative convolutional networks. 
as a way of competing with, with GAN's performance generated images. And okay, after our work, it was also tested in the Boltzmann machine and it happens exactly the same. So if, you, if your goal is uh, generating the best, uh, generating new samples, the best strategy is to do non-equilibrium, but you have to be aware of repeating exactly the same dynamics to, to generate data. What's the problem is that uh, as we saw, using this regime, you get a model that it's not a good model for the data. So you cannot use it for all the interpretability things that I was saying before. You don't have a good effective model with the data, you just have a good model in the time scale you want to study. So if you want to learn the, if you want to learn the, the equilibrium, uh, but if you want to, to learn the model, you should try to do equilibrium. And this means that you have to do more steps uh, sampling steps during the learning so that you can uh, you can thermalize. Okay, one of the nice things, at least uh, if you do equilibrium, is that all this non-monotonous behavior that we observe once you do uh, non-equilibrium, that it's one of the things that puzzles more when you do, you try to use RBMs uh, for training, that you you get things that can be good, but later you do some few steps and it gets horrible. All these effects disappear when you do equilibrium. Things behave in the way that we are used to, to be when we compute the, the configuration space of a, of a model. We get uh, models also that are much uh, uh, slower, they are much uh, faster. In fact, I don't know if I... <clears throat> I don't know if I have a slide on this, but we can see that if you do non-equilibrium very uh, for uh, quite a lot of uh, of time, you get uh, models that are, that seems to be an a spin glass. I mean, you don't thermalize it, but it's impossible or impossible to thermalize. This is a lot more similar to to standard phases with with good minima. What's the problem? That to do this, we need to use very large number of uh, of Monte Carlo steps. This means very longer learning training procedures. Okay, so we can ask how long this would be to do to do equilibrium. And uh, how, how am I with uh, time? Can I, Alex? Oh. You still have time, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, it's not too much, but okay. So yeah, we, we, 10 we can be fine. Ten minutes, it should be fine. Okay. Or fifteen. Uh, no, no well, ten minutes. Okay. I didn't know if it was out of time already. Okay. So the point is, the question is, how how long should I should I do this sampling to get the to to work always in the equilibrium regime? Okay. We try to estimate this. I can tell you, for instance, we we can distinguish two kind of cases. One, it's the, the easy case, which for instance would be a mist. In general, the images we found that it's uh, easier. Later, I would go to the to the hard case. And the point what we observe, okay, we can since we have the machine a different number of of updates of the parameters that we call it the the edge of the machine. We can measure the the mixing time, or we can measure the thermalization time just by checking at which point the, the quality of the sample converts if we start from different initial conditions and we get very similar, very similar results. Uh, but, I mean, the mixing time, the thermalization time is scales with the mixing time, but as we know, I mean, the thermalization is longer. It has to be several times the, the mixing time. But what we see, and it's quite interesting, is that, okay, when you start the learning, at, at, at the beginning, you get samplings that thermalize, I mean, the thermalization time is very, is very short. I mean, of the order of one steps, we are in this paramagnetic phase in which we are correlate so fast. At that moment, there arrived the, the learning transition in which the, the thermalization times grow sharply. It depends on the, on the actual training scheme. And from now on, if we continue training the machine for more and more updates, we get the thermalization times that grow grow with the number of updates with we can also understand because uh, once we are doing the training the effective uh, temperature of the system is going down i mean we don't have a we don't have a, a beta in the system but we the couplings 
are not uh, normalized, so we have a temperature in the system. So, I mean, we get a slower and a slower trade. So this means that if we want to be in equilibrium all the time, as you do more and more training steps, uh, do more and more parameter uh, updates, you should do longer, um, longer uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo to, to train the machine because the system gets uh, slower and slower. Okay, here, for instance, for this uh, mixing time, we can compute it just with the, the time correlation function and that's uh, exactly the same thing. I mean, if we start with, with machines that have some few uh, updates, uh, we, we get the, the correlations that are quite fast. And as we go on, it gets slower and slower. What happens if we take, as I said, uh, uh, MNIS is, is easy, but we, we can get more structured uh, databases. For instance, the one I was uh, uh, so in at the beginning uh, about the I mean, the 100 genome um, project in which we have the, the some part of the genome of uh, <clears throat> 100 people and we try to study it. What we see is basically that when we compute the um, when we compute the um, the mixing time, we get the, okay very few very small values for some number of the parameters. And at that moment, we see that we don't thermalize anymore up to 10 up to five steps. I mean, if we compute the time correlation function, okay, we get either something that they correlate so fast on something that goes beyond the our capability of, of measuring. So, um, okay, we were wondering, we have been wondering what was uh, happening and this is related, of course, with this transition that I was discussing before that was um, introduced in mean field, but at least when the weights are very are very small at the beginning of the learning, it's a good approximation. And what we see in this case, if we project, as I said, okay, we the, the model start to learn important directions of the of the data set. What we see is that okay, once we are in the here I saw the data projected on the features, I mean the principal directions that we get in the in the weight matrix. I mean we we get the agent vectors of this weight matrix and we project our data there. And here I saw the first direction and the second direction. What we see is that, okay, at the beginning of the, of the learning, before learning anything, when we project our data, it just, we just get one uh, maxima around certain values. But what happens just after the, we, just after the training is that this data splits up into. And if we go on and on and on, we start to get a lot more splitting if we do. I mean, we are doing out of equilibrium and this is an effect of this. So it's clear that now it starts to be, I mean, we want to sample the configuration, this configuration space. We have a barrier. So it's clear that we're going to have exactly the same problem that we normally have in, in, uh, in the, <clears throat> in the vicinity of a first order transition that we just get trapped in one of the maxima. Just to, to recall you about these metastable states, if we consider the easy model uh, at, zero, at zero field, okay, if we go down in temperature, we will have a, a critical transition, but if we go even below the critical uh, transition, we will have in practice, we will have a spon a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and we will observe either all this uh, last part of the spins pointing in the positive direction or a last part of the spins pointing in the negative direction. But uh, both, I mean, the positive and the negative magnetization uh, have exactly the same, the same probability. Okay, once you do a, a simulation, what you observe, I mean, in principle, you should observe half of the time the positive magnetization, half of the time the negative magnetization, but in practice, if your system is very long and you start a, a Monte Carlo chain, you will get trapped in one of these maxima only because for jumping from one ma to maxima to another, to another maxima, you have to build a, an interface between the positive and the negative uh, phases, and this has a this has a cost. 
So, I mean, the probability of crossing in between is extremely low. So unless you do an incredibly large sampling, you just sample a part of the configuration space. Okay, we observe these kind of things. For instance, uh, this is typical, I mean, at least with the gene data. When we do proteins, we observe exactly the same things. Data that clusterize in, in low dimensions. So this is done, for instance, with the, with the PCA, the principal component analysis. But when we do this with MNIST, we don't see this structure. I mean, it's a lot more uh, connected, uh, a, a big connected cluster. Okay, so we have been working, but I uh, just illustrate uh, on another strategy for this uh, clustering, for this clustered data set, which is essentially doing uh, umbrella sampling. Okay, we know that the way of the way of avoiding these problems of thermalization, where you have several ecosystem phases, is to impose a certain, uh, I mean, to, to force the, um, to, for instance, imagine that we have several clusters, like here, if we do Monte Carlo, as I said, you get trapped in one of these. And we know that the good way from physics to try to force to visit all the configuration space is to introduce some constraints in the dynamics. So we force the system to visit all the, the configuration space. This we have been doing not with umbrella sampling, with, but with a refinement of it, which is the Tether of Monte Carlo approach, which is a bit more convenient than umbrella sampling in the formal is to reconstruct the, the probability distribution function. So we don't have to keep during the learning a lot of information, but uh, I will skip. Uh, if you are interested, I can explain it a bit later. But the idea is that, okay, we can, if we have a good order parameter, we can compute the defective uh, potential and we can integrate and obtain the, the probability distribution of a clustered uh, data set. Okay, so this means that if we manage to do this during the training, that now we do, we are able to compute this, um, this negative part of the, of the gradient using this um, tethered structure in which later we have to sum up all the constraints introduced in the dynamics. And we can extend this to more directions, but I won't uh, discuss a lot. The only thing that I want to say is, okay, we can say the problem is that we don't know which is the, the order parameter of the problem, which is also a general problem sometimes in, in physics. What we know at least is the results that we have for the, for the restricted, uh, that we said at least at the beginning of the learning, we know that there are some magnetizations that are certain directions that are emerging. So at least at the beginning of the learning, we can do it. Well, and later what we observe is that, um, okay, this approach works quite well. If we have um, data that has, that it's, uh, that clusters in low dimensions, if we have very complex uh, data set with many possible directions, okay, this strategy doesn't work anymore, but we get quite better results. Okay, this uh, is a paper that we are writing now, so it's not this one. But I just come back to the, to the conclusions. So as I, <clears throat> As I discussed, this kind of machines, these energy-based models, basically they they are <clears throat> they operate in two different ways. If you don't do equilibrium, you learn the dynamics, you can exploit it and use it to generate very good uh, quality data. But you have to remind that you have to use the same dynamics for the sampling, digo, for the training and for the sampling. But you cannot. In principle, the model you have learned is not good. We don't know who to which accession this is good. This is important for the features or not. It might not be very important. It might be, but we know that the model that you get, if you do non-equilibrium, it's quite a, a pathological model. It's extremely slow. It seems like a, a spin glass. So it doesn't have the typical good properties that you would like to uh, for an effective model of, of your system. You can do on the other way equilibrium, but this can be problematic because you're as long as you progress in the during the learning, the typical mixing times get longer. So the longer you have to to sample the system, and we have proposed, but I just uh, gave some intuition about this. I didn't explain it 
a lot more. We have proposed another strategy based of our, on our experience in, in thermalizing uh, first order, uh, around first order transition that passed by introducing constraints in the, in the, in the Monte Carlo weight and later uh, remove them so that we can equilibrate up to situations in which otherwise it will be impossible. Because just to recall, even if you do whatever PGD, uh, whatever receipt you want to do, once you have this clusterized uh, data set, you never thermalize it. Even you can put whatever steps you want, but you're gonna uh, fade the, the problem of these metastable states and that ruins completely the, the equilibrium strategy. And with this, I, I finish. I hope it is not too fast. And if you have questions, I will be very happy to, to answer them. Thank you. So I think we can stop the recording, Anya. Are you there?